morning. Welcome once again. Uh, welcome back, those who are here for our first hour. This is our second hour on Sunday morning, and uh, this is uh, Portland Bible Church meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie. Thank you so much for joining us online on Judy Glennie's Facebook page or on the website. There's a link there. You can go down the services to uh, YouTube. We'll post that after the service. And so we thank all of you. We've got people from literally all over the country and all over the world. It's just amazing. God has honored uh, the ministry that he has given to us. And we uh, not only are grateful, but we are honored uh, by the privilege we have to teach God's word verse by verse, category by category in the historic framework in which uh, he had it penned under inspiration to the men that wrote our scripture. And so uh, we have our classes, as you know, on uh, uh, at 10 o'clock this morning. That's our first hour. We had a little break with some goodies that uh, many of our people have brought. So we thank you all for uh, participating in the Smorgasbord, I guess we could call it. And uh, then we have uh, the second service now at 1115. After our second service, we have about a half hour of singing the great hymns of the church, uh, recorded music. And so uh, just uh, many, many songs that we have. We've even had some requests from some other small churches for our music that we use because uh, they have uh, want to do singing and they don't have good recordings. So we've been working on it. We have about 200 of the great hymns of the church, just really amazing. And so we rotate through those in our hymnal. Uh, if you can join with us after the second service. On Thursday, we have our Bible study. We're doing leadership, Old Testament Kings. We're looking at uh, Josiah right now and principles of leadership. And then on Wednesday in the uh, afternoon at two o'clock, my wife Judy has a Bible study right here for the ladies. And she has a study that she's developing right now out of <clears throat> Revelation 2 and 3 which are the seven churches of Asia Minor. She told me she's just starting the Church of Smyrna. Uh, so if you've got your Bible, you can check that out. Uh, that is not recorded uh, online, so you got to be here in person for that one, ladies. At any rate, uh, that's our, our Wednesday service. And so we have uh, all of these classes available to you for probably a better part of almost a year and a half or a little more now, even beyond that. Uh, on Facebook and uh, almost uh, well over a year on YouTube, plus the fact that we have audio recordings going back quite a distance. Uh, we've had to revamp some of that, so not everything is available, but we slowly are getting some of the audio <coughs> pardon me, from previous years uh, available as well. So we'll continue that study because we've got about uh, 16 years of audio there, so uh, it's a lot of work to refurbish that whole thing. So pray for Judy Sanity as she is developing and uh, backtracking, trying to get all the audio available for you our custom to take a few moments at the beginning of each of our studies for silent prayer. Most of you who are here understand this is where we acknowledge or confess any sins that we're aware of to the Father so that we can have the enabling or filling of the Holy Spirit. We have the indwelling permanently, but the filling is contemporary as to whether we have sin, unconfessed sin in our life. 1 John 1 9 is quite clear. It says, if we as believers confess our sins, that is name them, cite them, agree with God that they are sins, he God it's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The all unrighteousness picks up the ones that we've forgotten or we didn't even know that we had committed. Subsequently, we believe that you have the enabling or the filling of the Holy Spirit. So we take time for silent prayer for that function so that we can be uh, able students of the word of God and process these things through our soul. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that uh, lives and abides forever. We thank you that we have from Genesis to Revelation all that you desire for us to understand about who and what you are. 
your plan for us in this life and our eternal destiny in the future with your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the material that we've been uh, studying as we have looked at the elements of communion in the first hour and as we venture into the writing of the author of Hebrews with regard to the relationship of the Messiah as fulfilling everything under the Mosaic law and all of those things that were taught of the prophets. We thank you for the things that we have before us. We pray that you would encourage, enable, challenge, and motivate us now by what we have before us in this second hour. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. God has said, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I wanted to look at, as we begin, just a brief remembrance of the Feast of Hanukkah. If you were here with us on Thursday, we developed it a little more at length. Also, if you want the full treatment, as it were, uh, we have that in the archives last year on December the 10th and December the 17th. You can go back and we go through the entire uh, study of Hanukkah or the Feast of Lights. And so we looked at a little bit of this in review on Thursday. Uh, we have some here on the table. If you want to just hold up your hand and we'll get them out there to you. So this is the Feast of Hanukkah or called the Feast of Lights. And so uh, without going through the details, we see that uh, this is a festival that is extra biblical. However, Jesus celebrated Hanukkah as mentioned in John chapter 10, 22. It's the only place it's mentioned in the New Testament. And of course, uh, it is celebrated by the Hebrew people even to this day. And it commemorates their freedom from tyranny from Antiochus Epiphany IV. And of course, he had shut down, as it were, the tabernacle and all the worship that went on and actually uh, forbade worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the point of death. Uh, if you had your children circumcised, you could be killed for that faith. And so we see that this was not something that God would desire. And a family by the name of the Maccabees, Judas Maccabeus and his uh, family became freedom fighters. And they gathered about 10,000 soldiers to fight uh, against Antiochus and his army and actually won back the temple and at least for a time regained some semblance of freedom. So they refurbished the temple and they reestablished the worship, consecrated everything. And of course, they were going to celebrate the consecration uh, on the 25th day of Kislev which is kind of like uh, our uh, no November, December. It's a little early this year because it follows the lunar calendar. At any rate, uh, they uh, prepared everything and they had the uh, menorah, which was part of the uh, tabernacle worship, and they were going to light it and they uh, lit it uh, for the, uh, they were going to light it for a period of time. And it turned out that they only had enough oil for one night. And the reason was not because they didn't have oil, but it had to be consecrated. And so it took about eight days to consecrate the oil. So they wouldn't have any oil for eight days. At any rate, they put what they had into the little cups. Olive oil is what they use. We have candles, uh, but they had olive oil. And so uh, uh, they set it up the first night and it burned for eight consecutive nights on one night's oil without having any additional consecrated oil. Subsequently, that became part of the commemoration, an eight-day celebration, recognizing freedom from tyranny. And so we can share with them, uh, I think, this festival of Hanukkah because uh, it uh, represents freedom from tyranny for them. And therefore, we can uh, uh, look at the fact that all freedom comes through military victory, that is, in terms of society, and all spiritual freedom comes through soul freedom, which comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ today. One of the things that's part of this celebration is that they've added traditionally uh, names for each of the candles. There are actually eight candles and then one in the center called the Shamish, which is the leader. And of course, for us, that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. All the other candles or 
uh, stems that have the oil would be lit, in, uh, lit by using that center candle. So there are eight on the side, four on each side, and the shamash. And I was going to get my... Um, uh, we forgot to bring it out. I was going to bring it out. And today is actually uh, the next to last day. So right now is the seventh day. And that will end at six o'clock this evening. And then we move into the eighth day of Hanukkah. So if you have your Hanukkah uh, candelabra, uh, you could actually uh, use that uh, menorah. The menorah is the same name that's used for this one that is used in the tabernacle for the seven stick uh, candelabra. At any rate, uh, the first of the eight candles is faith, which we understand everything is by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It goes through freedom, courage, love, mercy, or charity, uh, and then integrity, and the last two. So today, interestingly enough, would be knowledge. And that's not just secular knowledge. That would be knowledge of the things of God, the person and work of Christ, everything that pertains to God. So today is the candle or the light of knowledge. The whole candelabra, uh, the whole menorah, speaks of Jesus as the light of the world, subsequently the shamish in the middle. And then, of course, beginning at 6 p.m. this evening, it is the last lighted candle, and then all uh, eight are lit, plus the shamish, and the last one to be lit is called peace. And that dovetails perfectly with our communion service today because Jesus Christ gave us reconciliation, and he is the redeemer, the redeemer of the world. In fact, he even said that uh, uh, taking that uh, cup, which was the cup of redemption, said this is the new covenant in my blood. And so the redemption, the reconciliation, and the peace that results from Christ's death on the cross for those of us who believe in that finished work obviously would be applied there. So it's kind of fun to uh, see these things dovetailing together. So that's what we did to look at last time. And therefore, if you want that information, we have uh, the printed copy. You can go to the doctrine section, look up Hanukkah or the Feast of Lights, and you'll find it there as well as all of our other studies. In addition, we have studies there on the various outlines of books that we are studying or teaching, some in the past. We probably have about 80 or more studies there on all types of biblical subjects, everything that we've done over the past few years. I have hundreds, but they're not all on the website. Uh, we have to transfer them to Word, and that takes time, and I usually revamp all of those studies that we do uh, again and put new versions of them on the website. So that's a process that's going on, but we have that information there for you. Now, if you have your Bibles, open once again to Hebrews chapter 8, and verse 13, where we left off, this is the section B under 2, uh, 2, Roman numeral 2 was chapter 8 through chapter 10. So going up through chapter 10, we have the section of the superiority of the new covenant. It was mentioned back in chapter 7, verse 22, we noted that. And then, of course, again in chapter 8, verse 6, and all through chapter 8, we have then the new covenant, and so we have verse 13 is the last one here, and it speaks of the new covenant as making the first covenant obsolete. So that brings us up to where we are. Again, if you have your Bibles open, this is the verse. I'll read it, and then we'll go back and pick it up where we left off. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to disappear. That's pretty permanent. That's pretty final. That's pretty definitive. And people who say, you know, you should keep the law of Moses, that really flies in the face of the writer of Hebrews here in verse 13, as well as the book of Galatians by the Apostle Paul. At any rate, as we started this in the last hour, we noted that the phrase, in the saying, he is there, of course, referring back He's referring back here to uh, verse uh, uh, 8 in chapter 8. So going back to that verse, that's when he said it. Where did he say it? Jeremiah 31, 31, when he said new. And we did uh, talk about the word new before, but I wanted to review it because we have some new people, <laughs> and therefore they may not be familiar. One of the things that we see in English grammar and English vocabulary is similar in any other language. There are words that have the same translation or the same statement, but many times there is a nuance of meaning that is different. And so we have this word new for the new covenant. It's here in chapter 8.8. Eight. We'll see it again in uh, 
chapter 9, 15. You can look over chapter 9 and verse 15, and there it speaks of the new covenant. And the word new, in this case, is the Greek word kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S, and it means new. But it is the new in quality, new in nature. So it's not just something that is chronologically new. It was something else yesterday. It's, uh, it's more and is different today. It has to do with a better quality, a better very essence and nature. So it's a new covenant that has a better quality, if you please, than the old covenant. And so we see this here in 8.8 8 and 9.15. And of course, if you go over to... Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, we see that even towards the end of this epistle, the writer refers to it again in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. And there he says, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. There it is again, neos, uh, 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 kainos. Uh, I'm sorry, this one is the different word. That's what I wanted to go over here for. So here is a different one. Yet in English, it says new covenant, but in the Greek, it's neos, or neos, actually, N-E-O-S. What's the difference? Well, the word neos means new in time. It came later than the other one. So again, both of them are the new covenant, but one has to do with its quality in chapter 8.8 8 and 9.15. But in Hebrews 12.24, it has to do with the fact that it is more recent and therefore new in time, uh, new in origin. It has a different beginning totally than the uh, Mosaic Covenant. Why is the new origin? Well, it was stated in Jeremiah 31, 31 and following, and Jesus ratified it at the Last Supper. So it's new in time, but it's also new in quality. So the word new is used several different ways, even though in English you can't see it. And it may be a small point, but it is interesting that it is both new chronologically in time, but it's also new in nature and uh, quality as well. So I just wanted to mention that uh, we have this word kainos used uh, <clears throat> over in 2 Corinthians, just to kind of show you another place where this word uh, kainos is used. This is new in quality. So look at 2 Cor uh, Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. You'll know the verse when you get there. You'll remember it. It says, now... Let's see, I've got to get the right chapter, okay? Chapter 5, chapter 5, 17. It says, therefore, if any man is in Christ, there's our concept of positional truth. Everything that we possess in this life and in the life to come is courtesy of our being entered into positional union with Jesus Christ. We share everything that is his except his deity. And therefore, if any man is in Christ, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> he is a new creature, and so here we have this idea of new in nature. We have a new nature, and so if you're in Christ, you have a brand new nature, a new spiritual nature. You've been regenerated. As uh, the Gospels say, we have been born again. We are totally different. I know you may look in the mirror in the morning and say, yep, that's me. I recognize me anywhere, and you may feel the same. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a totally new nature. I'm not sure about this, but I often think that when God looks down and the angels look down, they may see an effulgence around us, a glow or a radiance around believers. It's invisible to us now, but I think that God can actually see because we're new creatures. We have a new essence, if you will, and it may be visible uh, to the Lord and to the angels as he sees us in human history. That's just a thought. Uh, I'm not making that something that is dogmatic or doctrinal, but uh, God knows who are his sheep. And of course, uh, uh, obviously, we are new creatures, whatever that means. It's new in nature. It's new in quality, not just new in time. Certainly, it's new in time when you believed in Jesus Christ. You went from the old man to the new man in time. But the new man is nature different and quality different. So I thought I would go over there and see uh, that particular word as well. So in saying this, the new covenant, we've added the word there, he, met, he has made old the first, and we can add the word covenant, and that of course refers to the Mosaic covenant. Now the thing being made old, whatever it is that's old, I don't know about you, but I got a lot of old stuff in my garage. And as my wife would tell you, I ought to get rid of a lot of it. 
best way to get rid of things is to move because when you move, you go, boy, I haven't looked at this in 10 years. Out it goes. And you get that big uh, uh, metal container and it all goes in there when you move. Of course, I'm unfortunately a pack rat, and I keep a lot of old stuff. But uh, many things are growing old, it says here. Uh, and being made old, they are near to disappearing. My wife would love for some of my old stuff to disappear. At any rate, the point here being that the Mosaic Covenant should be disappearing. And yet we find that the cults, for the most part, uh, who adhere to any type of Bible as part of their uh, information, and many churches today sadly adhere to the Mosaic Covenant. Now, I will grant you that Codex 3 of the Mosaic Covenant, which is the judicial and legal portion, is what we have based much of the Constitution of the United States on. Not all of it, because we don't execute people for uh, disbelieving in God, or uh, we don't uh, uh, discipline children by stoning. I mean, there are certain things that are part of the Mosaic Covenant, uh, Codex 3, the judicial section, that we don't do. But freedom and many of the things that are part of jurisprudence are there as well. Uh, marriage, all of those things are in that section, which is not what we would call the spiritual law code. Those things pertaining to the person and work of Christ, all of the festivals, all of the celebration, all the offerings, uh, the priesthood and all of the function of the priesthood. That's Codex 2. Uh, Codex 3 is the judicial, which has to do with society, and it pertains to all members of society in Israel, not just those who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it was a nationwide uh, part of the code, and therefore much of the constitution of this country is based on principles of Codex 3, the judgments as they are called uh, in the Hebrew, the mishpatim. Codex 2, the Kokim, has to do with those things that pertain to Christ. And Codex 1, if you're interested, has to do with the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words or Statements. It's kind of the preamble to the Constitution of Israel, and the Mosaic Covenant is basically the constitution for the nation of Israel. But it's not the constitution of our nation. <clears throat> it's not even the law that we live by as Christians. However, people say, oh, so we're lawless? Not at all. We live under a higher law. So Jesus is up the ante. And so from the Mosaic law, you know, he says, well, in the Mosaic law, uh, <clears throat> you know, that uh, if you did certain things, uh, uh, obviously, for example, if you committed adultery, uh, it was punishable by death. And so there's a whole litany of things that deal with, uh, with uh, uh, sexual impropriety. Uh, but uh, Jesus, but if you look on a woman, with lust. You've committed adultery. So the new covenant, the new law in Christ is stronger as it were. The difference is it's written on the hearts of the believers and that's the difference. And so the old, that is the Mosaic covenant, is disappearing in the sense that its functionality of telling us that we're sinners is kind of a tutor to bring us to the point that we recognize we can't keep the law. What will we do? Paul says, woe is me, but thanks that we have Jesus Christ who has fulfilled all of the law. And when we believe in him, we fulfill the law and are called to live under a higher law, the law of Christ written on our hearts. So in that sense, he says, it's near disappearing. Not that it will ever disappear because God's law is God's law. And the Mosaic Covenant still says this is what God requires. But being under a higher law, we live under the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the dispensation of the church and apparently on through into the millennial kingdom. We've studied some of that in the past classes. And so in regard to the disappearing, we have here ah, <clears throat> phanismos. Aphanismos, that's the Greek word, and uh, phanismos means visible, P-H-A-N-I-S-M-O-S. Phanismos means to be visible or to be seen, visible or seen. And then we have the letter A in front of this word, which makes it aphanismos, and that's what we call the alpha privative. For those Greek students, that makes perfect sense. For the rest of the students here, they go, what is that? Well, it negates the word. It's like in English, we would put non or un in front of a word, you know, uh, and uh, we have uh, words that are changed from being positive to negative by un, un, or non. 
okay? But in Greek, they put the letter A in front of any word, and it negates it or gives the reverse. So this would be non-visible, non-appearing. And so it's not the sense that it's no longer in existence, although that's what uh, uh, some might suggest here. And again, it says here, uh, I'm ready to disappear. I don't like that translation. I like the fact that it is uh, not going to be seen, in other words, it's not operational in the sense that is how we live spiritually. And we live spiritually under the law of Christ as the law is written in our heart, not under the letter of the law. And that's taught all through the New Testament, book of Romans, Paul and Galatians, and none, not the least of which is in the book of Hebrews by its author here. And so we see that uh, this idea of not being visible, not being utilitarian may be a good word uh, to replace it. By the way, this word only occurs once in the New Testament, one of many words that are unique to the book of Hebrews. I've mentioned several times, and again, uh, I'm speaking to the, those students of the language here, that uh, if you're studying in the Greek and you have a first year Greek, <clears throat> uh, you won't see, <coughs> pardon me, many of these words. Uh, and so unless you study the book of Hebrews, this is the only place you'll see this word, aphanismos. And so there are quite a few words that have one or two or maybe three at the most uses in the whole New Testament. Sometimes it only occurs two or three times in the book of Hebrews. So this is what we call high class Greek. And to tell you the truth, when I first was teaching, I stayed away from the book of Hebrews. I was scared to death of it. Somebody said, it's hard Greek. And so I was going through the Johannine epistles, very easy. Even the book of Revelation, you might think that's difficult because it has a lot of symbols. But the Greek is John's writing. And John writes the easiest Greek, the Gospel of John. A lot of times, first-year Greek students will study the Gospel of John. Very easy. You can almost sight read it, well, if you have basic Greek. But you get to the book of Hebrews. And I may take six hours on a verse sometimes struggling through the grammar and uh, the syntax in the book of Hebrews. You know, can't see it in the English. And fortunately, that's what I do as a pastor. But it is interesting. And so this word only occurs once. So the best we can do is that the old covenant is not really usable, not utilitarian, not visible. Therefore, it should not be part of the operation and function of the local church or believers today. Now, I can't say that, say that too often because we see so much legalism in the church today. I mean, people make up laws. Well, that's not just in the church age. Back in the age of Israel, we see that uh, the Pharisees, they made up laws. I forget how many. There were 613 laws in the Mosaic Covenant, and I forget how many hundreds, uh, literally, uh, in the tradition that they had. They added all sorts of things. I mean, they had a tradition where you couldn't wear shoes that had metal in the soles of the, of the sandals because that would be carrying a burden. I mean, they went to such extreme that uh, people would be violating the Sabbath. Well, they attacked Jesus, you'll remember, because he was healing a person on the Sabbath. And he said, well, you know, God, uh, Sabbath is made for the man, not man for the Sabbath. And so Jesus said, you know, you guys, you, you swallow the camel and spit out the gnats and things like that. So this idea of legalism was rampant through Israel. And of course, the church began in faith. And the apostles clearly taught faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And for by grace you save through faith and that uh, alone, obviously, uh, not by works. Uh, over and over again, Paul describes it. And yet what we see in the churches today, almost everywhere, is some type of legalism. Even sometimes in the most evangelical churches, where they have become so ritualistic that they can do it only in a certain way. I guess that's why this type of teaching is not that popular today, because we don't have a lot of ritual going on. We have the communion service, and some people don't even like to do that. They feel it's boring. Well, that means you haven't understood the person and work of Jesus Christ. Water baptism. Some don't have water baptism, and yet it's a one-time event to signal the representation of your death with Christ going under the water and his resurrection coming out from under the water. That's it. Can you imagine two rituals? Think of all the rituals they had in Israel. Every day of the year they had sacrifices. <clears throat> On feast days, multiple thousands of sacrifices. And they got to participate in some of it. Some of it was burnt completely up. And so those rituals are gone because Christ fulfilled them all. 
I can't say that enough. I can't say it clear enough. And yet, what do we see today? You have to dress a certain way. You have to act a certain way to uh, accommodate a particular variety of Christian church, for example, rather than simply the assembling of ourselves together and studying the word of God and fellowshipping one with the other and sharing the spiritual gifts that are still functional during this part of the dispensation of the church, praying together, all of those things that are part of local church function. But uh, the Mosaic Covenant is passing away in terms of its functionality, its utilitarianism. Okay, some passages to support this. I want to look at a few because you say, where does it say that? Well, we have studied the book of Galatians. We won't do all of these, but I do want to give you a tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Galatians, which we studied in detail, you can get that uh, obviously at the website. Uh, we did the entire book of Galatians uh, on video, so you can get that. So in Galatians chapter 3, uh, where Paul starts this uh, diatribe with regard to the legalism, and he says in chapter 3, verse 1, You foolish Galatians. I, I, I have to smile because the Old Testament proverb said, Call no one a fool. And yet fools are people who reject the reality of truth. And so he says, You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? tricked you, basically, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by the works of the law? Well, there it is. By the works of the law. Did you do something? Did you do anything to get the Holy Spirit? No. In fact, it was the absence of doing, it was believing. Believing is non-meritorious. There's no merit in the believing. Merit is in the object of faith. Jesus Christ is the object of faith, and therefore we believe in him. As believers functioning in the Christian life, the object of faith is the word of God. So we believe in Jesus Christ, that's the object of faith, and we study and take the word of God in by faith. And we live by faith. Not only do we take in the word by faith, but we live by faith, and therefore we please God. And so did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or by hearing with, here it is, faith, get it? Now, that's just one of many, many verses. It goes all the way down through verse 7, and you can see in verse 6, for example, even so Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him, or credited, we might say imputed, righteousness to him. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith that are sons of Abraham. Genetically, and for us, of course, spiritual descendants. Paul tells us that we have become spiritual inheritors of the promises to Abraham. Not everything. We don't get the land. That goes to Israel. But we get the king, Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, we jointly reign with him. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, thank you very much, by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations shall be blessed in you. And, of course, uh, all through that section, you can look at it. Uh, but uh, uh, verse 5, for example, does he then who provides you with the Spirit and uh, works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? In the Greek, the idea is here uh, to have an answer uh, by, by faith, not by works of the law. So the idea is given there. And so we see it in this chapter as well. Oh, you can even go down to verse 21 through 26. For example, it said, the law is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. One of Paul's favorite statements when he rejects them. May it never be, he says. And he uses it over and over. For if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, in other words, if the Mosaic covenant could give you eternal life, I had people, and I've talked about this, and I've even had people comment. I said, there are those people that I've talked to who believed in the Old Testament. They were saved by keeping the law. Not true. It's always been grace. It was grace in the time of Noah. It was grace in the time of Adam. And uh, uh, all through the Old Testament patriarchs, it's always grace, always faith. Abraham is the quintessential example of faith. And so he says here, may it never be for if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. But righteousness based on the law is unrighteousness because you can't keep the law. Oh, woe is me, Paul says. Well, we're going to die in our sin. No, Jesus Christ became righteous. Jesus Christ is the very essence of righteousness. 
and that righteousness has been imputed to us by virtue of his death on the cross. The scripture, it says in verse 22, has shut up all things, not just men, everything under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to what? Those who keep the law. No, those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law. He's speaking to the Jewish people, because Paul is a Hebrew of Hebrews, if you will. And he says, we were kept in custody under the law, looking forward to someone to deliver us from the penalty of failing to keep the law, which we couldn't do. So we were under custody, being shut up unto faith, which was later to be revealed. Now, they did have faith, we know, because Abraham believed, and it was reckoned imputed to him as righteousness. But without faith, many people kept the Mosaic Covenant thinking that they would be righteous. We have it today. The Jewish people in the synagogues today, those places that are not uh, messianic uh, churches, they believe that by keeping the law, that they're pleasing God. And of course, obviously, that never happened in the Old Testament under the law. It certainly doesn't happen today. It never happened. And just a caveat here, in the millennial kingdom, and most of you are familiar with this, they're going to have sacrifices. They're going to follow many of the things, not all, and it's a different system than the Mosaic Covenant, but they are commemorative offerings that will be performed during the kingdom, much like our communion service. We don't have the blood of Christ in the cup. We don't have the body physically of Christ in the cup. It's memorial. It's commemorative of that Passover, that last supper that Jesus had. In the millennium, we're going to revert back to the sacrificial system as memorial, as reflecting back to what those things taught to Israel. Since the kingdom, of course, basically will be ruled by Jesus Christ, a Jew, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and the Hebrew people, and Jerusalem will be the capital of the world at that time. Well, I, that's an aside, but just the fact that here we see uh, verse 24 is important because it says, therefore the law, that's the Mosaic covenant, was, has become our tutor, even to the Jews today. It was a tutor leading us to what? Telling us we can't keep the law. We can't do these things. And even if we could, it's not going to save us because obviously we can't. So he says it was like a tutor to bring us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. It doesn't get any better than this. I can't make it be more than it is. And it says, uh, for now that faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor. That's the same thing that our verse, Hebrews 8.13 says, it's disappearing. We're not under the tutor. Have you ever gone to school and had difficulty? When I was a kid, I had difficulty reading. So I had to have a tutor to help me to read. I really didn't learn much from the tutor, except I was a bad reader. What I needed to do was, guess what? Read a lot. <laughs> and finally, when I started to read a lot, I got better at reading. Well, it's similar to that, but not exactly the same, because we have Christ who gives us access to uh, the righteousness through faith in him. But the point is that the tutor can only do so much. You still have to do the work. I tutored students in math a few years back, and sometimes I would tutor, and I would go through it, and the next time they came back, they still didn't get it. And I'd go over it again and again, and i go, remember we did this last week? Remember we did this two weeks ago? I don't remember. <laughs> and so the tutor can only do so much. And even the people who tried to keep the Mosaic Covenant, they were many times doing it out of rote rather than out of faith to such an extent that by the time of the prophets, what did they say? God says your sacrifices stink. I don't like them. I hate your sacrifice. What? God said do this, and now he's saying that he hates them and they stink. Why? Because they were not mixed with faith. They were simply doing it as a ritual. That happens in the church. People take communion unworthily out of fellowship. It's blasphemy. In the first century, uh, when the church was beginning, you remember, we had people who could actually die, uh, the sin unto death, because they kept the communion unworthily. That is, they were out of fellowship. Thank God he took that rule up, or we'd be losing a lot of church members around the way, I think. But uh, at any rate, uh, uh, obviously, a person who takes communion unworthily is under discipline. They may not realize it and say, I don't know what's wrong. Things just don't seem to be going right. Could be you took communion unworthily. In Israel, of course, you know, you could die for doing these things. But at any rate, uh, here it says, uh, and so uh, when faith comes, we are no longer under the tutor. 
uh, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And you were all baptized into Christ having clothed yourself with Christ. Neither Jew or Gentile, neither slave or free, neither male or female. Obviously, there are males and females. Obviously, there are Jews and Gentiles. But he is saying in Christ, there's no difference. We're all the same in Christ positionally. We all have uh, salvation. We all have forgiveness of sin. We all have a resurrection body coming because of faith in Jesus Christ. And if you belong to Christ, he says here, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. As a Gentile, well, I'm not genetically of the Hebrew line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but Paul says I am. I am spiritually because I'm in Christ. What a wonderful thing. Why is this so hard for people to get? It just mystifies me, except that ignorance is seemingly rampant. Just look around at our nation today and see the ignorance. We've gone through what the Proverbs say. There's the naive group, and that's the group that doesn't know any better. Then there's the arrogant group. They're the ones that think they know, but they really don't. And then there's the fool that believe the deception and the lies, and they live by those lies, which, of course, will lead them into the lake of fire if they do not change their ways and accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's just one. Now, I'll minimize some of the others, but that was so important because Paul is the quintessential uh, uh, faith guy, I guess we could say. And so when you go over to Ephesians chapter 2, we know the verses. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, of course. It says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that, not of yourself, it's the gift of God. That's the whole salvation package, not faith that is given by God. Obviously, we have free will to make decisions, but it's the whole salvation package uh, that is here given through faith. And you believe, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Notice verse 9, not a result of works, not the law of Moses, not any other made up or manufactured laws that no one should boast. Why? Because when you have some legalistic system, I'm a better Christian than you are because I do such and such. Oh, and so I become superior to you because of behavior that puts me above other Christians because of my good works. And therefore, I'm a better Christian or I'm more saved than you are, if that means anything at all. Of course, you're either born again or you're not. You either have eternal life or you don't. I don't know what part people say. I only have temporary eternal life. Well, that never made any sense to me. I have these people. You could lose your salvation. I go, well, if I have eternal life, how do I lose eternal life? You either have it or you don't. There's no partial eternal life. Now take that one to the bank. John says you can. these things have been written that you may know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have everlasting life. Well, if you could lose it, then you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have it. If you have it, you have it. If you don't, you don't. <laughs> Doesn't seem complicated to me, and yet people make it so. And then notice the next verse, which is important and most times left out. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We might say recreated in Christ Jesus. For or unto good works. This is production, Christian life, the experience, what we call phase two, living the Christian life. We were not just created to be saved, not just to have eternal life, not just to get a resurrection body, but to do things in this life. Elsewhere, particularly in the book of Hebrews, we'll see, it's to be pleasing to God so that we glorify God. That's our job description. That's what we're here for. Not just to get saved. Certainly God wants that. But he wants a people of his own, a special people. A, I like the words in uh, uh, Peter. He says, a peculiar people. <laughs> and sometimes I think some Christians are more peculiar than others. But that's another subject. At any rate, and it says, which God prepared. He's prepared a menu of production for each of us. Each of us has spiritual gifts. Each of us has uh, uh, gifts that he has given that are applying to our mentality and our physical function in the Christian life. And of course, all of these have been planned and prepared for God. And so there's in that heavenly storehouse all these things that are for blessing for us and for our production that we can access in the very presence of God in this life. And it is therefore that God has prepared beforehand what he would give us to do, that we should, what? Walk in them. We walk in them. And how do we walk? We walk by, guess what? 
you guessed it, faith. All right, so that's that one. And uh, I got time for Titus here. Uh, time's running short, but I wanted to look at this because this is so important. And I, I, as I say, I can't overstate it. And if you feel like I've said it too many times, good. <laughs> All right, Titus chapter 2. Great passage there. Titus chapter 2 and verse 5. <clears throat> Titus chapter, did I say 2? Actually, it's three. I've got the wrong number down here. Titus chapter three, verse five. Titus, Titus chapter two, five is, is good too uh, because it deals with summation of the Christian way of life. The whole of chapter two is a summation of the Christian way of life. But in chapter three, he goes back and says, remind them. Hey, I got that, Lord. I got it. Remind them to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Great. And then he gives a list of things we ought not to do. Malign no one. Be uncontentious. Well, we see that in Christendom, do we not? Gentle, be gentle, showing <clears throat> every consideration for all men, because we were once foolish ourselves, he says. But I want to get down to the next verse here. And uh, it talked about uh, verse 4. It says, And when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared. Jesus Christ is the kindness of God, Okay, and he's the love of mankind. Jesus is both kindness and love. Elsewhere, it says that he is grace. And so, as a matter of fact, that's in verse 11 in the previous chapter. Chapter 211 says, but the grace of God as appearing here, uh, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. What's the grace of God? Well, it's a plan of God, but it's the plan vested in a person. Jesus Christ is grace. Jesus Christ is kindness. Jesus Christ is the essence of love. Of course, he is the way, the truth, and the life. All the attributes of divine essence are in him, some stated here. But here's where I want to go. Verse 5. He saved us. <coughs> Not, <coughs> pardon me, one last verse and I'm getting choked up. All right. <coughs> he saved us the salvific work of Jesus Christ, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. That would be relative righteousness. In other words, thinking that we're keeping the law or doing things that please God to gain access to God, to get saved or to live the Christian life. We don't even live the Christian life by doing works to, uh, uh, to please God. We do them as a result of having the Holy Spirit producing in and through us according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. This mercy, as we have seen, is what's called grace in action. Grace is the plan of God. Mercy, then, uh, uh, is the action of grace. The plan of God has action, and that is mercy. So we see these verses and again, we may take a look as we come back next time. I think our time is running out here. Okay. Uh, and so you can look. Here's your homework. <laughs> You'll get a homework assignment. And that's Romans chapter 4, uh, basically starting in verse 2. But most of Romans chapter 4 addresses this same issues that we have been talking about, that the Mosaic Covenant is ineffective. It is non operational during the dispensation of the church. But keep in mind, we live under a higher law, the law of Christ. How do we fulfill it? By faith, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit who indwells and fills us, and through the word of God, that's our textbook. What a marvelous thing that we have. Father God, we thank you so much for your word that lives and abides forever. We thank you for these powerful passages. We pray that in all those who hear will recognize that our salvation and our living of the Christian life is all by virtue of faith in your son, Jesus Christ, and in your word. We pray that we would continue to be faithful and obedient, doing those things that are pleasing in your sight so that we can give all the glory and honor to you, Father, and therefore we will share in that glory in the future in our resurrection body. Hallelujah. We look forward to that so much, Father. And for that person here, is uh, without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, and they're here for the first time or listening for the first time, we want you to know that Jesus had you personally in mind when he went to the cross. Hard to believe, hard to understand. He bore the sins of every member of the human race, past, present, and future, once and for all people, once and for all time. He became the second Adam, the perfect man, the sinless sacrifice, the lamb without spot or blemish, as John said. 
And therefore, by his work on the cross, you can have everlasting life, forgiveness of sin, a resurrection body, and a place in the palace in the new Jerusalem at the end, be at this marriage supper land. What a great future we have. And even some of us will have positions of leadership and rulership in the kingdom. Hallelujah. We look forward to that, Father. And so we pray for this one person that might make that decision even now. For God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely appointed only born son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. John says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know, know there is to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you so much for another opportunity to study your word. We thank you for the blessing that we have to do this, to share and to fellowship one with the other. And we pray that you would enable our hearts to accept this material as from you and make application to every situation in our lives following this day. For we pray it all in the powerful, majestic name of Jesus Christ. Amen.